Welcome back to another episode of Villains Too Stupid to Win, and special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. This time we'll be looking at one of the biggest bads in all of fictional history. It's Sauron from the Middle Earth Cinematic Universe. And please note we'll be looking at the extended editions. It's the movie series they said couldn't be made. Based on J.R.R. Tolkien's beloved fantasy universe realized on an epic scale never seen before. Jackson sacrificing much of Tolkien's original story in the name of creating a more suitable experience. Yet the result was still so masterfully executed, anyone but the stuffiest of Tolkien purists would surely acknowledge it's a cinematic triumph. It ruins it! Yep, it's going to be pretty hard to criticize this thing, and I almost feel bad that I'm picking on Peter Jackson content two videos in a row. Almost. What about second breakfast? Firstly, I will admit they did manage to put New Zealand on the map this time, and in the process created a massive tourism windfall that continues to this day. We've probably made more money from the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit movies than the Tolkien estate. And just like our dairy industry, we've been milking it for all it's worth. We were so committed to getting the Hobbit series filmed here, the powers that be colluded to bring in additional generous tax breaks for the producers. PJ got his knighthood while the peasants at the coalface got their rights eroded thanks to some union busting legislation. Yeah, Smeagol isn't the only one who's been corrupted by this thing. Into the Dark Lord Sauron, a wannabe Satan and a villain in waiting, desperate for someone to put a ring on that finger so he can make Middle Earth his bitch. Yes. Sauron is the ultimate in absentee leaders, often spoken of but rarely seen, appearing in the flesh during flashbacks in a Return of the King deleted scene, but only revealing himself in the Third Age timeline as a notorious tower eye and a demonic apparition. We don't need an army to defeat this guy, we need an exorcist. Or a proper wizard. Or failing that, you could just find and destroy Sauron's favorite little trinket. Point 1. Sauron forges a ring of questionable effectiveness, putting himself at great risk. So thousands of years ago, 19 great rings of power were crafted and given to the lords of elves, dwarves and men. But a power hungry Sauron crafted a master ring in secret designed to control the others. And in doing so, poured in a great deal of his essence and power, forever linking his fate to that of the ring. It's the one ring to rule them all, or at least some of them. The ring was somewhat effective in that it corrupted the nine kings of men and allowed Sauron to conquer many of the free lands of Middle Earth. But its vague level of control didn't allow him to subjugate the dwarves or the elves, or prevent the eventual alliance which saw Sauron defeated after his digits were cut off by a Sildur. What the hell were you reaching for anyway? Swing that colossal mace, buddy. What's it doing? So the ring, in terms of control, was obviously a bit of a failure. In the novel, Sauron had to go to war to secure the other rings. He had this jewelry for a grand total of 1850 years, and over that period he was defeated a total of three times, and at no point did he managed to fully conquer Middle Earth. So guys, we can do better than Sauron. If you're looking to expand your dominion over the internet realm, consider building a dominating website with Squarespace. Whether you're creating a page for an existing business, an e-commerce site, consolidating your portfolio, or starting a blog, Squarespace is an all-in-one platform delivering all the tools you need to build a slick-looking, functional website and run your business. Squarespace comes with a range of fully customizable templates. The user interface is extremely easy to use and it's packed with useful features such as marketing tools analytics and the ability to create password protected pages member only areas and mailing lists you can even customize your URL or purchase a domain name directly from Squarespace but perhaps most importantly Squarespace sites are designed to automatically adjust to display correctly on any device you can be assured your website will always be looking at its best so guys if you're ready to bring your vision to life Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're set to go live, visit squarespace.com slash mediazealot to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.
So anyway, the ring did not live up to expectations in terms of its mastery over the other rings. But since we're daring to dip a few toes into book lore, let's be fair about it and analyze the full scope of the ring's powers to see what, if anything, could have benefited Sauron. First, the obvious one, invisibility. Or more accurately, the ring allows the wearer to phase out of the physical world and into the spirit realm. It also allows the wearer to understand black speech, project a false image of their appearance, and live an unnaturally long life. All of which won't help Sauron since these powers appear to be based on abilities he already possessed before he had the ring. Which leaves just a few remaining effects that could potentially benefit Sauron. The ring has the power to corrupt and longs to get back to its master. Though this barely seems to help Sauron at all. Since it stayed embedded in a riverbed for two and a half millennia. And then when it finally finds a few ring bearers they all keep it secret and keep it for themselves. The ring also has the ability to augment the natural attributes of the wearer so that's definitely something and it's also said to bring about a sharpening of senses so as a divine being Sauron should already be pretty sharp okay I admit it's not looking good so far the ring may also serve to enshrine Sauron's power allowing that part of his spirit to remain constant and undiminished the theory being that anyone looking to fully vanquish Sauron would need to destroy his body and also go through the hassle of destroying the ring which they'd probably be compelled to keep and that's it that's that's all it does. Its most powerful abilities still somewhat passive in their nature and I would argue none of them justify the massive weaknesses the ring creates for Sauron. For a start, Sauron's body begins to disintegrate the moment the ring is separated from his hand. An injury that even a mortal man could survive is somewhat fatal to Sauron, or at least presents a massive setback for him. Though in the books, it admittedly played out a bit differently and Sauron was apparently in a weakened state during this conflict. Yeah, there's probably no way I can navigate this intentionally ambiguous narrative delivered to us by unreliable narrators without pissing off a bunch of Middle Earth law lords. I've made peace with it. What can men do against such reckless hate? Prior to forging the ring, I can't imagine Sauron's physical body would die from such an injury. He got his throat ripped to shreds in the first age and he managed to survive it then. And if the ring was really the only thing holding him together at this time, well maybe he should have fled instead of making a personal appearance. You let the enemy walk in and take it on a whim. But the most concerning flaw of this thing has to be its effect on Sauron when it's inevitably destroyed. As we saw in the movie, Sauron's control over his forces is immediately halted, and his modest physical presence in Middle Earth crumbles to dust. But according to the novel, Sauron can now only exist as an angry wisp of black smoke, permanently unable to take physical form or manifest himself in any way that could again threaten Middle Earth. Before the ring was crafted as an immortal Maya, if Sauron were killed he would still exist as a potent spirit, with the ability to eventually reconstitute himself by various means. So in terms of allowing Sauron to regain a physical foothold in Middle Earth, the ring never seemed to be necessary. There is no way to completely wipe Sauron from existence, but crafting the ring has created the possibility that he could be permanently rendered impotent. He's essentially created a super weapon that only works against himself. A massive Achilles heel that isn't even attached to his body and can't be tracked easily. So if Sauron was reckless enough to forge the ring in the first place, you just know the rest of his strategies aren't going to lend themselves to ensuring the ring's survival, let alone allow him to win the massive war he's committed to bringing about. Point 2. Sauron prematurely exposes himself to his greatest enemies. So after Sauron's vanishing act all those years ago, his next appearance is in the Hobbit franchise. At this time, Sauron's enemies appear to believe the Dark Lord is gone for good. Come to the mountain. The spirit of Sauron endured which for a savvy operator would present a massive opportunity. But rather than building his forces in secret and striking Middle Earth without warning, Sauron brazenly announces himself to his greatest enemies, clearly laying out his intentions and resolving to attack the dwarven city of Erebor immediately. Why? Well, it's strategically important. And he wants gold? His master seeks control of the mountain. Not just for the treasure within, but for where it lies, its strategic position. I guess they need something to pay those nihilistic mercs with. The Dark Lord only knows what the hell these morons plan to spend their money on. Potatoes. 
No matter what strategic benefits holding Erebor might afford him, it couldn't possibly compare to the importance of keeping his existence secret. In fact, it's better if you don't speak at all. And if Erebor must be taken, then why not send the orcs there on the lowdown? Just a pack of rogue orcs sniffing around for some gold. Nothing to see here. He's given his enemies a massive 60 years to prepare for the coming conflict. He's just lucky Middle Earth was so divided and leaderless. They could have marched on Mordor and messed him up well before he could pose a threat to them. As for the battle at hand, it seems Sauron's declaration of intent wasn't the only thing around here that was poorly timed. The White Orc's worm tunnel ambush would have been impressive if they didn't turn up at the precise moment that would unite four factions against them. A defining trend of the coming campaign and the first of many strategic errors Sauron and his forces are guilty of. Point 3. Sauron's campaign to secure the ring and Middle-earth is plagued by oversights and infighting. His lack of security precautions around Mordor assures his ultimate doom. So we kick things off in the modern timeline with a preloading Gandalf puffing on that dank pipe weed before heading off to a hobbit shindig. He's brought a stash of buzzy fireworks, those little shits better bust out a good feed. The salted pork is particularly good. Nowadays Gandalf seems to have become complacent, only now beginning to rally the troops when the threat of Sauron has become imminent. Full of pipe weed. All the more stranger considering once Gandalf finally pulls finger, his most impressive power ends up being political meddling. And that's barely even a joke, Gandalf's firing has the ability to encourage others to resist tyranny. It's probably had far more impact on the world than the Master Ring could ever hope for. So he starts by mugging Bilbo for his ring, before confirming this is indeed the MacGuffin to rule them all. Flogging off this massive burden to poor little Frodo, sending him and Sam off into the wilderness alone. Your love of the halfling's leaf has clearly slowed your mind. You see, Sauron now knows that Bilbo from the Shire had the ring thanks to Gollum ratting them out. And somehow the useless prick has failed to find the Shire in 60 years like he had anything better to do. Sauron gets underway by sending Nazgul ringwraiths to find this hobbit, and they're screeching like banshees warning their prey of their approach. They can presumably sense the ring is nearby, but this ability appears to be extremely limited. Later in Breen, the ring puts itself on Frodo's finger, alerting the nearby Nazgul. And even Sauron himself makes an appearance and confirms he can see Frodo has this thing. I see. The Nazgul simpletons waste a bit of time stabbing empty beds before eventually catching up with our hobbits after they let their munchies get the better of them. Tomatoes, sausages, nice crispy bacon. So now the Nazgul have seen the ring on Frodo with their own dead eyes, taking their sweet time to kill him only to be scared off by one man with a flaming torch. Though to be fair, I'd probably be running too if I had the flammability of kerosene soaked tinder. You've shown your quality, sir. Meanwhile, Gandalf meets up with Saruman the White, spilling the beans on Frodo and the ring, before the White Wizard outs himself as a servant of Sauron. Getting a bit sentimental for his old friend, he chooses to imprison him rather than kill this obvious threat to his master. Friendship of Sodom is not lightly thrown aside. Surely he should be well aware of Gandalf's Dr. Doolittle abilities. So with nothing but a hint of the ring, Sauron seemingly chooses this moment to start his campaign to retake Middle-earth. Rather than waiting until he actually has the ring, or probably more importantly, waiting until those meddlesome elves have left Middle-earth for good. A fact they're casually advertising. Saruman has been busy ramping up the war effort, pumping out these supposed Urukai elites, and kidding them out with blunt weaponry. You want some? A similar strategy to that of the Galactic Empire, preferring to create overwhelming numbers of troops but supplying them with substandard equipment. One of many aspects of Lord of the Rings George Lucas apparently drew inspiration from. Though unlike the Empire, Sauron's heavy forces and siege weaponry are somewhat impressive. The trolls for example make up for their stupidity and sluggishness by providing unique advantages on the battlefield while also delivering a bit of genuine shock and awe. They have a cave troll. Back with the halflings who with some assistance from Aragorn and Arwen have made it to the relative safety of Rivendell. Reunited with Gandalf and some other random stakeholders, the Fellowship of the Ring is formed. Saruman sends out his forces to intercept them, giving his commander extremely vague orders. One of the halflings carries something of great value. 
bring them to me alive. He probably doesn't want to be too specific should the Urukai be tempted to take the ring for themselves. But without knowing what exactly they're looking for, the mission is doomed. We have so little faith in your own people. So predictably, the Urukai nab the wrong hobbits and don't even bother to check their pockets, not that they would know what they're looking for even if they did. They then turn around and start running all the way back to Isengard, wasting all this time while Frodo, Sam and the ring slip away. Make sure your packs are secure to avoid chafing. Before the closing of the Fellowship of the Ring, Sauron seems to sense Frodo one more time and I'd like to think the Nazgul would have passed on their intel by now. They appear to be telepathically linked to their master as ever evidence at the end of the franchise. Even if they can't communicate with Sauron this far from the eye, they're left with plenty of time to work with. Although Saruman has a direct line of communication with Sauron, he may secretly cover the ring for himself as it was in the books, and so he may be choosing to withhold information from Sauron. All right then, keep your secrets. But at this point, even without Saruman's intel, the logical conclusion that Sauron should be drawing is there's a ring quest heading southeast towards Mordor, probably looking to drop off the ring for a swim in Mount Doom. Sounds like orc mischief to me. Back in Isengard, Saruman decides to up production by building a ramshackle dam right behind their subterranean factories, which just can't be a good idea. Build a dam, block the stream, work the furnaces. He also starts feeding Fangorn Forest to his furnaces, when a wizard should know that land is occupied by powerful giants who are currently politically neutral. You may want to avoid pissing them off, especially considering their proximity. Over in Rohan's capital, Edoras, Wormtongue, the most obvious deviant ever, has been running a con on the kingdom that includes pretending Saruman is still an ally. Saruman the White has ever been our friend and ally. But then the White Wizard is sending his Urukai into Rohan with his mark plastered all over them, which makes it difficult to keep that ruse going. And Saruman has been in the room the whole time, it's practically all he's doing. But it all falls to ruin thanks to Wormtongue having made the mistake of sending a Rohirrim to disarm the visiting fellowship instead of one of his goth loyalists. Fully armed and filthy. Considering Saruman's influence over this court, I don't know why he didn't just command Wormtongue to open the gates in the night and let his forces in, long before this point. Yeah. Why can't we have some meat? As a native horseman, Wormtongue doesn't truly want to see Rohan destroyed, but he's still willing to do anything to ride Eowyn. You stink of horse. So Saruman is now forced to attack Helm's Deep, which is about as epic an encounter as we could have hoped for. The only criticism I'm daring to offer is their misuse of this substance that is the equivalent of gunpowder. Obviously Saruman may not want Sauron to get his ghost hands on this tech, but at the very least they should be utilizing this throughout Saruman's army. Whoever manages to use this to its full potential is probably going to win the war for Middle Earth. War is the province of men. Which begs the question why our good guys aren't rocking any explosives, when at the very least Gandalf is aware of fireworks. The one time we see this stuff in action, it's devastatingly effective. Though Saruman is lucky they were able to blow anything up, since they've got the ignition grunt running in all conspicuous with an Olympic torch full of sparklers, when there are dudes with flaming torches literally a couple of meters away. But it's all for naught anyway, our heroes eventually saved by Gandalf's cavalry run and a vicious case of sunstrike. Saruman then gets his comeuppance for his poor decisions earlier. The surviving Urukai forces from Helm's Deep seemingly still too numerous to justify a retreat are gobbled up by Fangorn. While Isengard itself comes under full assault, Saruman's only response is to have a panic attack, cowering in his tower, failing to cast a single spell against this onslaught. Meanwhile, Frodo has another close encounter with a Nazgul, confirming the ring is in Gondor, remarkably close to Mordor, before we head into Return of the King. We kick things off by wallowing in the aftermath of the Battle of Isengard, with Saruman calming down enough to engage in a bit of verbal sparring before he finally decides to cast a spell and it's a frickin' fireball. You know when that would have been really handy? Yesterday when we were fighting those highly flammable trees. You're hopeless. 
He then fails to watch his back around Wormtongue, who has lost the only thing that motivated him to align himself with Saruman in the first place. A bit of a redemption arc for Brad Dura, which in terms of defying his typecast is about as much as he could hope for. Next up, Pippin has a run-in with the Dark Lord, who despite being a powerful spiritual entity, somehow managed to give away his battle plans. Props to Pippin for not giving anything away, but at this point, with a clear pattern of evidence about Frodo's intentions, Sauron shouldn't be in any doubt. The excuse for his perceived oversights naturally come from the novels. Supposedly blinded by his own overconfidence, it's suggested Sauron believes that no one could possibly overcome the corruptive powers of the Ring, and he may also suspect the Ring is on its way to Gondor and Aragorn, who he recognises as the only real threat to his power, an idea that's hinted at in the Sauron Pippin clash and a few other scenes from the movies. Sauron fears you, Aragorn. He fears what you may become. We should seek to destroy it, as we not yet entered the darkest dreams. But this only creates another error in logic for Sauron. If he truly believes no one can resist the ring's power, why would he also believe someone would travel halfway across the world to give the ring to someone else? And even if your own head canon can explain away all of Sauron's errors up until this point, I struggle to find anything that could justify his lack of precautions around Mordor and his actions going forward. Looking to get past the Black Gate? Well luckily there's an inadequately guarded mountain pass that'll lead you right into Mordor the perfect route for an infiltration mission by Little Folk. You shall pass! Though Frodo is eventually scooped up by some orcs, it's through no skill of their own, taking him to yet another tower as if we didn't have enough of those. But thankfully, our real hero Sam has pocketed the ring, and a bit of infighting between the orcs and Black Uruk clears the place out almost completely, allowing him to mount a rescue mission. Dressing up as the most unconvincing orcs I've ever seen, but apparently enough to trick these idiots. We're innocent travelers! Meanwhile, Sauron opts for a surprise attack on Osgiliath by lighting lighting up the river with torchlight on their approach. Why doesn't that surprise me? Before unleashing his gammy army on Minas Tirith, led by the Witch King. The same guy who had Frodo at his mercy, yet did everything but grab the ring before being scared off by one dude. Do you really want the slow coward leading your forces? Bring wood and oil. Seriously, a flaming sword? You may want to be careful with that. The closer we are to danger, the further we are from harm. After mopping up Sauron's forces at Minas Tirith, Aragorn runs a brazen attack on the Black Gate in an effort to create a diversion for Frodo. Sauron falls for it hook, line and sinker, clearing out every single one of his soldiers from Mordor, despite possessing crushing numbers of troops compared to Aragorn. And there's no reason for Sauron to think Aragorn has the ring at this point, because the mouth of Sauron is well aware Frodo has been found, bluffing about his fate in an attempt to demoralize our heroes. Know that he suffered greatly at the hands of his host. Five minutes after, the sometimes seeing eye spotted a very alive Frodo a stone's throw from Mount Doom. And if he can't see Frodo from this distance, then what the hell is the point of this thing? Sauron should be panic stations right about now. He is yet to receive the ring, and the halfling he has previously seen with it is loose in Mordor. But he still doesn't devote any forces to shore up Mount Doom. Nope, not a single solitary orc. For seen and done nothing. Not to mention the apparently psychic link between Sauron, the Ring, and Frodo. Are you not even getting a tingle right about now? So completely unimpeded, in the very heart of Sauron's empire, Frodo and co are free to crawl into the hilariously named Crack of Doom. <laughs> Which is of course ridiculous. Sauron's lack of security and possible overconfidence punishing him severely. Throw yourself in next time and rid us of your stupidity. While Sauron is technically right about the ring's corruptive abilities, he obviously didn't account for the range of possible scenarios that could see the ring destroyed. It's the ring, of course there could be a bit of a tussle. And he was acting all shook the moment Frodo put the ring on in Mount Doom, so he seems to be aware its destruction is possible. There are many powerful, intelligent people who want this ring destroyed, so there are probably other scenarios that would have worked too. To say that it is impossible is an exaggeration. Yeah, the obvious option. Give those those lazy eagles a crack at it. We come to it at last. Supposedly, they're too proud, stubborn, or scared of those foul beasts to drop the ring at Mount Doom. Yet they're showing up at an active battlefield at the 11th hour, absolutely sassing their counterparts. So a high altitude stealth mission could definitely have hit the mark. Let's just hope the eagles are beyond corruption, because that would be a nightmare. Fly, you fools! 
or perhaps you could get the most pious bunch of heroes you can muster. And if the ring bearer won't throw it in, then just push the bastard off like Alron should have done all those years ago. I don't care if it would have started a war. It would seem like wisdom, but for the warning in my heart. And note how both Sam and Alrond were able to resist the power of the ring from a distance, even when it was in great danger. Which lends itself to the idea that a group of people could complete this quest. Mount the ring on an arrow, then put a blade to the throat of a blindfolded archer tasked with firing it, and a blade to the swordsman's throat, etc. Or put the ring in the pocket of a blindfolded orc, then trick him into walking the plank. Okay, take those last few ideas with a grain of salt, but the point is, there are probably other ways to tip this thing over the edge that don't rely on happenstance. One does not simply walk into Mordor. So with the ring's destruction seemingly coming down to a matter of fate, Middle-earth can finally know peace. Saved by a sweet-talking yet impotent wizard. An unlikely duo of sadistic dude bros united by their mutual love of killing. I'm on 17! A wannabe king with an elven fetish and a few filthy hobbits and the power of friendship. But with a prequel Lord of the Rings series on the horizon. It'll be interesting to see whether any of Sauron's errors will be retconned or perhaps added to. Whatever the case, it's safe to say the real Lords of the Rings will always be those who keep on cashing in. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for precious. And don't forget to like precious.